Here's Carolyn Jarvis. Good evening and welcome to our season finale of 16 by 9. In the rapidly developing field of genetics, scientists are mapping out how we are built, how we are different, and how we evolve. But one area of the field that has only recently gotten attention is how our genetics come into play when taking prescription drugs. What doctors have uncovered is that what we are made of can mean drastic, even deadly differences in how we react to medication. And as Beatrice Politi reports, a one-size-fits-all approach can be a risky prescription. doting parents and three young, healthy boys creating chaos wherever they go. It looks like a complete picture, a complete family. But there is something missing, someone missing. He was beautiful and he just seemed perfect and healthy. Tarek was the oldest of Ronnie and Doug Jameson's boys. He would have been seven years old this year. When he was born, he, he seemed very like an old soul. April 18th, 2005. Tarek was born healthy at Toronto's Mount Sinai Hospital. The childbirth was normal, but the pain of an episiotomy was too much. Ronnie was prescribed Tylenol-3 with codeine. I kept asking, is this safe? Yes, it's safe. You know, I was told that sort of the cliche, you know, a little bit goes through the breast milk, your baby might be a little drowsy. Dr. Gideon Corrin, one of Canada's leading pediatricians and toxicologists at Toronto Sick Kids Hospital, says Tylenol-3 with codeine has been used for generations for postpartum pain. Codeine has a good name. It's the safe narcotic that you can get and take home. When Tarek was 12 days old, he wasn't feeding as well, and his color was changing. Growing increasingly worried, Ronnie called for help, and an ambulance was sent. And so the ambulance and fire truck and police all show up. And it was just ironic because he stopped breathing when they got here. Frantic efforts to save his life failed. Tarek died just after midnight at hospital. Like all unexplained infant deaths in Canada, an autopsy was performed. And what the coroner found was shocking. Lethal levels of morphine. How did it happen? In the months that followed, an idea began to form in Ronnie's mind. Could she have unwittingly killed her own child by feeding him tainted breast milk, tainted by the very drugs she was prescribed? The answer was sitting right here in her fridge. And I thought about tossing it because I didn't want it around, but I just luckily just never did. And it was in Dr. Corrin's lab where the breast milk was analyzed that the mystery was finally solved. The level in Tarek's body was 80 nanogram per ml. If you have levels above 20, you stop breathing. How could an infant have lethal levels of morphine in his body? Tarek's mom produced more morphine than the next woman on the block because of her genetic makeup. As it turns out, Ronnie is what's called an ultra-rapid metabolizer. She has an extra copy of the gene that converts codeine into morphine. So when she took the drugs, her body created lethal levels of morphine. According to Dr. Corin, her case was the first confirmed link that codeine can kill through breast milk. This case was unique. After we published it in Lancet, the FDA, the Food and Drug Administration, said this is enough for us to change labeling. Tarek's death was a wake-up call for regulators and the drug industry to issue more robust warnings. But that message doesn't seem to have trickled down. <laughs> Ten months ago, Deanna Henderson gave birth to her son Lucas in Stratford, Ontario. Like Ronnie Jameson, Deanna was also prescribed Tylenol-3 after giving birth. I said, is this going to harm the baby? Or, you know, is this okay for the baby? And she said, oh, it's, you're fine. It was prescribed by the doctors. Two days later, Lucas stopped breathing while lying in his bassinet. He didn't look like he was really alive. It's just he wasn't moving at all. There was a lot of yellow mucus around his mouth, and he was going blue. Doctors couldn't figure out what had happened to this two-day-old child. I said, oh my gosh, you need to test my, give me a blood test and find out what is in my system. I said, what about the drugs? Doctors did a urine test, and sure enough, they found the presence of morphine in Lucas's body. So the drugs that they had prescribed to you mm -hmm. almost killed your son? Yeah. Yeah. The dangers of codeine have been suspected since the 1800s, 
and some doctors suspect a number of cases go undetected. It's quite common not to know why a baby died. I'm quite sure that quite a few of those were codeine in breast milk, but no one checked. You don't check, you do not find. Ronnie and Deanna's cases may seem rare, but the number of ultra-rapid metabolizers of codeine can be quite high, depending on your genetic makeup. If your parents came from Northern Europe, you have about 1% chance. But if you came from Ethiopia, it's about 30%. We find on average for a city like Toronto, which is people from 220 countries, it's about 7%. Canada is only now just beginning to develop guidelines for gene-based treatments for drugs like codeine. But a number of centers in the U.S. are beginning to put it into practice. It's just not defensible anymore to have some of this knowledge so clear-cut, and yet we're not using it in medicine. Mary Relling is heading up a study here at St. Jude Children's Research Hospital in Memphis, looking at how genes affect a person's response to drugs. If I give 100 people exactly the same dose of aspirin normalized for their body size, the blood levels of the aspirin might differ tenfold from one person to another, simply based on their genetic variability. The hospital is testing patients for hundreds of gene variations with the aim of tailoring prescriptions according to each person's genetic makeup. But when it comes to codeine, some say the risks are already too high. I think ideally codeine should be taken off the market and we should learn to use morphine. Back at Toronto's Hospital for Sick Children, Ronnie Jameson's story set a precedent. Codeine is no longer being prescribed to children and Mount Sinai Hospital also stopped prescribing it to nursing mothers. But nothing will bring back Ronnie's son, Tarek. You're just, you're consumed with a certain sadness that's always there. It's always there. Next on 16 by 9, did a drug meant to heal? Something was going wrong. He was just so agitated. Drive a young man to destruction. and he really lived up to that. He, uh, he was um, fun-loving and, uh, and really good-natured. Brennan McCartney was a gifted athlete, a popular guy at this Bolton, Ontario school with loads of friends, a boy never at a loss for words. He wore his heart on his sleeve. He always knew what he was feeling and he would talk to you about it. In November 2010, 18-year-old Brennan made a doctor's appointment. He was complaining of a chest cold. He was also in the process of breaking up with his girlfriend. Normally, Nancy would have always gone. I think this is probably the first appointment you didn't go with him. His medical records show he was given a prescription for his chest cold, but he also came home with something else, a sample pack of an antidepressant called Ciprolex. I said, I don't, you know, I don't think you need this. Like, why are you taking this? And he said, well, the doctor just thought, thought it might help. He had moments of sadness, but there's, there's a difference between being sad and being depressed. And, um, and that's what we struggle with the most. His parents have gone over those days in the fall of November 2010 a million times, but nothing seemed out of the ordinary until the afternoon of Monday, November 8th. Something was going wrong. He was just so um, agitated. Brennan came home after school that day. But then early that afternoon, he suddenly said he had to leave. He says, it's okay, Mom, I've just got to go. Uh, I've got to go. That was not Brennan that walked out the door. That was Brennan under the un influence of an antidepressant. Brennan never came home. It would be 24 excruciating hours before his parents would find out what happened. He, he drove from here down the road to the store and bought rope. And then he drove to the conservation area and uh, he texted his dad, he texted his brother and he texted me basically to tell us all that he loved us and he would see us soon. And then he uh, hanged himself right after that. 
In the days and weeks following, his family struggled to understand how the boy they knew could take his own life. It was something the psychologist the family sought out didn't understand either. I was kind of ticking off the, the what I would have looked normally for for red flags. Whereas with Brennan, there seemed to be none of that. One of the first things the family did was to give psychologist Leslie Bomber Brennan's cell phone, and she began to look for clues in the messages he sent in the 24 hours before his death. 12.25, Brennan texts his mom and says, Hey, Ma, how's the conference going? How are you feeling? Brennan texts a friend uh, saying, I've been stuck behind the same damn Bolton train for at least 12 minutes. There was nothing, nothing, nothing that you would have suggested that he was sad, unhappy, uh, having a tough time. After Brennan's death, Nancy reached out to their family doctor and kept a detailed journal of her conversations. November 11th, I went in to see the do family doctor. He was visibly upset and said, I'm so sorry for your loss. I've been going over my conversation with Brennan a hundred times, and he told me that he would never harm himself. On January 14th, 2011, I went to see the doctor and I told him that we were wondering if Ciprolex was a safe product. He told me that he has 50 other patients doing well on the drug. In the end, Nancy and Sean McCartney believe their son's death is due to one thing. Nothing adds up other than the only new factor in Brennan's life was the drug. Ciprolex is largely considered a safe drug and is widely prescribed. The makers of the drug say there is no evidence that the drug increases the risk of suicide. But like every drug, it carries risks. Risks the company includes in its warnings but risks the McCartneys say neither they nor their son fully understood. Psychiatrist Roger McIntyre, who widely prescribes antidepressant drugs in his own practice, has seen those side effects firsthand. They report to us within the first few weeks a worsening of their distress. They report agitation, in many cases irritability, they didn't have before. Mary Rowling at St. Jude Children's Hospital in Memphis studies the interaction between genetics and drugs. She says, as with codeine, genetics can affect how we react to antidepressants. We have two genes that we call high-risk genes. If you have um, not enough copies of the gene and the blood levels of the drug get too high, then the patient may have unacceptable side effects. Brennan's case was so puzzling, psychologist Leslie Balmer began to wonder could being on the drug for only four days lead to treatment-induced suicide? She looked for a second opinion and reached out to UK-based psychiatrist Dr. David Healy, author of numerous books criticizing the pharmaceutical industry. It seemed to be a very clear-cut case. This was a young man who, if he hadn't been put on the antidepressant that he was put on, wouldn't have gone on to commit suicide. Finally, the McCartneys thought they had an answer to the mystery of their son's sudden suicide. And so they asked their local coroner's office to run toxicology and genetic tests to see if the drug might have played a role in his death. But the coroner's office refused, saying that any testing would be inconclusive. I don't understand them not wanting to say, we need to look at this and review if he was predisposed for this drug being an issue. It would be of interest to know whether or not in a post-mortem, in, in, in an autopsy scenario, whether or not people who complete suicide handle medications very differently. And this is the kind of thing that, that coroners should be investigating. It's been 17 months since Brennan took his own life. The McCartneys are still looking for answers and don't want to see this happen to another family. You know, from our standpoint, uh, um, you know, regardless of what the coroner's office wants to believe, the doctor wants to believe, the drug company wants to believe, there's a lot of things that are broken in the system. They want an independent agency to determine the safety of drugs, and they'd like to see more stringent warnings imposed by Health Canada on antidepressants. I still think that he's going to, one of these days, just walk back through the door. People say, you don't know what you have till it's gone. We knew what we had, and we had cherished and adored what we had. We just never dreamt we'd lose it.
Next on 16 by 9, paying a price for being unwed and pregnant. Our babies were being abducted, literally abducted from our bodies.